Okay, so it does say recording. We're going to go. Welcome, Phil. I'm so delighted to have you here with me today. Um, to everybody that's watching, I just want to introduce you to my friend and mentor, Dr. Philip Maffetone. And we've been talking for a few minutes already to warm up and realize we better ca capture some of these great things we want to talk about. But before we launch into that, I want to make sure you understand who Phil is. Um, I'm going to do my best to run down this list. Your bio is very long and I want to do it justice. So Dr. Phil Maffetone is um, a world-renowned educator, a researcher, um, a clinician. Um, he has worked with world-class athletes. Do you want to name drop a little bit some of the athletes that you have worked with? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, try. I've worked with I've worked with you. That's that's what's important here. I gotcha. <laughs> uh, world class athletes. Um, he's a. It, this is a fun story. We don't really have all the time for it, but he's a clinician turned musician. Um, he has worked with the likes of Johnny Cash. He toured with the Red Hot Chili Peppers to try to keep them healthy while they toured the world playing their music. Um, all of this just really to say that Phil is someone who is a real genius in many ways and thinks outside the box. And so you're going to see that as we share here today, his expertise on nutrition and lifestyle and what that has to do with your kids and their brain development and their learning. Um, talked with a lot of moms lately and the word that comes up a lot is anxiety. My kids have anxiety. So I'm going to get Phil to help you understand what that is here in a few minutes. Um, I think the other thing I want to share, though, is how I came to know Phil was through my own journey. I was, um, I uncovered every rock. I was throwing everything out of the way on my path to make sure that my own daughter, who was brain injured at 12 days old with meningitis, would not have to live a life of disability. It was just not okay with me. So um, luckily, that journey brought me to Phil and his work on um, nutrition, lifestyle, um, sleep and stress. We're gonna cover some of that today. Brought Haley from a brain injured, learning disabled child who had seizures to an independent, successful college student. She's in the next room right now studying for a chemistry exam coming up this weekend because through her experience, she's decided that nutrition science is the way to go. That is her path. She is determined to revolutionize what she calls, and Phil would agree with me, the sick care system we have right now, and try to teach people that we don't need to treat these disease, diseases like Alzheimer's and uh, dementia, late, late end of life, terrible diseases need to be prevented. And um, through that work then, of course, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You know, I had to live this lifestyle as well to make my kid well. And who knew? I just had no idea that it would transform my life in this way. I, I think I, in the email I sent to you, I was saying, thank you, Phil, because I was a sickly kid. I was kind of a sickly, um, I, allergies, I, I was on allergy medicine every, what, September to August to November of my life, drugged up, you know, asleep in bed, itchy face. I mean, I just, I was a un, very unhealthy person, and I was laughing the other day as I rode my 20-mile bike ride through southern Indiana, through the hay fields, past the ragweed in the fall. I'm in the best shape of my life. I hear my, uh, my friends and colleagues complaining, women my age, about hormone problems. Their bodies are falling apart. They're miserable. And I just kind of slip away because I can't have those conversations, and I don't really want to brag that I feel great. Um, but I feel great and I want to thank you for it. So let's take a moment to do that. Thank you so much for what you taught me. <laughs> thank you, Darcy. And you know, you did all the work. Um, I, I made some suggestions and uh, kind of steered uh, you in the direction of uh, food and exercise and stress. And, you know, that, that, that's all I can do with people. And that's what I've done my whole career, given them the opportunity and some of them take it and results are what you described. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's so joyful for me to see that, for me to see you know, how you've improved, how you've progressed, um, uh, and, and of course, you know, how you've 
helped your daughter um, do the same. And so um, congratulations to, to you too. Um, and here we are, we're, 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 we're teaching other people. That's uh, um, really what, what I've done. That's be healthy and fit. Um, and and the, the process uh, is, is it's never ending. Um, and it's a it's a wonderful process for me, rewarding to say the least. So it's fun that you say process. That's something I think about all the time because the truth is what this has really done is help me to learn how to live in my human body. And that's you know, that's the primary relationship, but it's an ongoing relationship that you have to live, like how to listen to your body, to understand what it's asking for, what it's asking you not to do anymore. And that, you know, that really is a moment to moment thing. Um, I just want to, I want to say this too, Phil is the author of many books, and I'm going to hold up my two favorites that I think are really important for parents. The one that you co-authored here, Healthy Brains, Healthy Children, um, is really important for parents who are wanting to understand more about how this applies to small people. And then this one, my autographed copy, which I never loan out. I think this one is out of print now, the No Nonce Infinite in Health. It is out of print, although there is a new edition that's expanded called the Big Book of Health and Fitness, uh, and that's the newest version. I'll put a couple of those links below. I have to tell you, this is called In Fitness and In Health, The No-Nonsense Guide to Diet, Exercise, and Disease Prevention. And this book was so powerful to me, I think, because it started with a story, you know, the story of that race, right, and what can go wrong. I just want to read a quick quote here because I think this has, um, this is a good intro for what I wanted to say about kids. Um, Phil writes, if you try to run life's race in that same random way, your race won't go well. It can be difficult relying on your natural instincts for living because they have been lost in the modern way of life. They can be retrieved through education and healthy habits. So this is a book about preparing for life's long journey. In the following sections, we discuss specifics of diet and nutrition, exercise and self health management that can make a huge difference in your success in the human race. And he says, I hope to see you at the finish line. You know, I, I'm going to get a little emotional here because I think about the finish line. I think about the way my grandmother crossed that finish line, you know, and it's an, an end state of chronic disease. I think about what you've written about your work with Johnny Cash, you know, the end of his life. And that that is so typical of, um, people in our Western world and our modern societies. And I think about children because nobody raises their children to eat and live in a body that they want to end up that way. But that's exactly what we're doing. We're starting them on the path of that by what we do and what we feed them. Like if you walked into, well, you probably haven't. I know you well enough to know you probably haven't walked into a big box grocery store anytime recently, unless you, you really had to have some paper products. But, you know, I was in the Kroger the other day. I don't do it often either. I buy from a local farmer and um, as much as I can. And I had to walk into the Kroger and I mean, it's frightening. The piles of bags of candy are taller than me. They're six aisles wide, right? So Phil, what, what are we doing here? What do we need to how do we really need to look at this? Well, we, we've gotten ourselves into a big mess. We've been doing that for decades. Um, and a good analogy that people can relate to is the tobacco industry. Tobacco, cigarette smoking was, you know, very, very popular for, for decades and decades. And uh, in the early 60s, the, the Surgeon General announced that um, tobacco was was bad, um, and people just said, "Yeah, well, you got to die sometime." You know that that attitude is is obviously a, a problem, and um, we've done the same thing with refined food, with sugar in particular, and um, so there's no there's no control. Um, if you're a company and you make sugar and sugar products, you could do anything you want. You could arrange for children to see the ads like Joe Camel 
to see the products uh, at, at eye level in the grocery store, to be given uh, lollipops in your dentist's office and grandma and grandpa bring you candy and come on, this is, this is um, there, there's no one that thinks that's okay unless they're addicted to sugar and they feel bad about saying, you know, um, otherwise. So uh, where is it going to stop? We're on this big merry-go-round and, um, and we, we, we keep hurting more and more children. We keep hurting more and more adults as well. We keep lowering quality of life. Uh, for the first time, uh, we're seeing uh, in the U.S., we're seeing uh, children who are not living as long as their parents lived. Uh, we're seeing uh, reductions in quality of life on, on measuring um, various things. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a, it's a sad situation. And we, we, the problem is in part, there's a huge political component. And so that's not something that can easily be changed because of the lobbying, because of the, the money, because of the power grabs, because of big corporations like big tobacco. And, you know, we think we've defeated big tobacco. We've done nothing with big tobacco. Sure, we had this big lawsuit years ago and, and we won. We didn't win. All we did was cause them to spend money that they see as cost of business, cost of doing business. And they're bigger than ever. Their reach is greater than ever. And tobacco sales worldwide are greater than ever in human history. So, oh my gosh. you know, what have we done there? Um, the illusion is that, you know, we, we've, we've stamped out smoking, we've stamped out tobacco. Well, that's just a lot of crap. And mm. the junk food is following the same path, except we're nowhere near along the way with, uh, you know, people not smoking on airplanes anymore or in, in buildings or uh, our kids like we were are not, not exposed to as much secondhand smoke. We're still exposed to it. Um, we're exposed to, to, you know, to junk food, to sugar, which does even more damage and more quickly to the human body, the, the brains and bodies of children and adults than tobacco does, which takes a, a, a while. I mean, you get an immediate stress, but the, the measurable damage takes a while. Um, you eat a lollipop and there's measurable damage. No yeah, doubt about that. Can I just interject this really, really sure. fast too? Well, so the idea too is that like, that's, I think that's why so many parents struggle because it's normal, right? It's, it's ubiquitous. You can't walk through a store. I mean, it's everywhere, commercial, TV, and it is, you, you said it, your grandma and grandpa <laughs> want to give treats because it's become syn synonymous with the way we show love. If yeah, and that's really sad because the love has taken the back seat and, you know, the junk food has, you know, everything from, from giving chocolate hearts at Valentine's Day. I mean, what a stupid, how stupid can you get? You know, what kind of society have we created when, when, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself, but I remember when uh, when giving a pack of cigarettes or a carton of cigarettes was not uncommon for a birthday, for holiday, you know, Christmas time, you know, just it, you know, uh, we haven't come a long way, baby. We've, we've <laughs> screwed things up even more, and we we have we have put more under the covers so people don't see it, but it's okay. all still there. Well, you said there about immediate damage. I want to mention this story. So I, I'm going to out myself here just a little bit because Haley's not here to do it for me. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, I've basically been sugar-free. I, I honestly have lost track of years. It's probably a decade or more. And I say that mostly sugar-free because there are certainly occasions like where it slips in and people would say to me, don't you ever cheat? And I'm like, mm, no, I don't really because I don't cheat myself. I'll get a headache. And here's, here's the in most interesting thing. This was within this year. I was, I think maybe I was at Aldi and I was impressed. I was like, oh, 
they have imported German chocolate. Oh, it's 85% dark. I wonder if I should just try that. You know, it's been forever since I've had anything like that, anything out of a wrapper, you know. With, And so I did, I bought a bar and I opened it in the parking lot and I, you know, and the first bite was like, oh my God, I forgot chocolate is so good. Well, it's really not the chocolate so much that's so good. It's like the immediate release of the sugar. It acts like cocaine <laughs> in your brain. But so- yeah. So I know that, um, and I'm going to have you explain that to everybody here in just a minute. Because so, but here's the thing, and I didn't have just a piece. I ate the whole damn chocolate bar, you know. It's a, and um, but I'm thinking to myself, it's only got, you know, the whole thing only had maybe 10 grams of carb. I'm still under my limit, you know. I do I do uh, therapeutic ketosis most of the time these days. It didn't even knock my blood ketones down that much, so I'm I'm okay, right? I'm okay. Um, my pants still fit the next day, so check, check. But but the next day, I started having really nervous thoughts that are completely out of out of the normal for me. I started worrying about something was gonna. I just started worrying about my dog. I, Haley was gone. I, I could hear sounds more. Like I thought I heard things like banging and clanging. I couldn't sleep well that night because I could hear the clock in the next room and I didn't sleep well that night. And so this is like what I would call a low level of just generalized anxiety. Sure. And it lasted for about two days and I knew what it was and I was able to just drink a lot of water and I fasted for a bit. I, you know, so I got myself out of it, but I thought, whoa, that was powerful. And I thought, whoa, there are people eating that chocolate bar like every day and living with a chronic state of anxiety that it causes and then wondering why they're I was depressed and lethargic too and I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a book right now so I usually wake up every morning I got a race to my computer so my fingers will <laughs> catch the ideas as they're downloading like you know this is a state of health and creativity and that I live I live a very happy healthy life and I realized in that moment the the wonderful chocolate bar incident taught me whoa this is powerful stuff. Do you want to explain physiologically what that was and what, and the same thing happens to kids. The same thing does happen to kids and it's, it's, it's not as noticeable. It's not as noticeable by the parents. It's usually not as not, not noticeable by teachers and, and others who are around observing the kids. They don't usually observe for that. It it's, looks normal. Yeah, it looks normal because uh, all the other kids are doing it um and and it's it's um it's it is observable um i could see it when i'm with uh when i'm with kids who are who are eating that way you can you can pick out who's eating what um but um the parents have to recognize it the parents have to i mean the parents are in charge of, of these kids the kids don't go shopping the parents do Um, so, you know, it's just a, there, there, there's some big issues here, which I know you want to discuss and, and the whole, the whole thing about responsibility, uh, kids are, some of them are old enough to be responsible and, and at an early age, they begin to, f to understand that big picture, that concept of responsibility that, you know, I can choose these things or those things and these things are healthier and these things are, are, are better for me um, than, than those things. Um, so those concepts come early, and, but if, they, if they're not exposed to the ideas, uh, they have to learn it later when they may not learn it because they're addicted. Right, and they may not learn it because they're not recognizing how that feels in their body. I think if I hadn't had that decade of like clean slate time, I, you know, because, I look back and I'm like, oh, I, oh yeah, I used to be that anxious, depressed, lethargic person, you know, kind of moving from one sugar episode to another. And a lot of people think when I say sugar, they mean like, oh, dosing up on a whole bag of candy every night. I mean, it could literally be, you know, you move from pizza to pretzels to your ice cream to your, you know, so but that chronic state of um, like, I want to call it like it, I could feel it in my, in my like in my cells. It's cellular. Yeah, it is. It's it and and the word addiction. I have a a, a 
an article on my website called Sugar Addiction, um, or is sugar addiction real? Something like that. And, and my argument is that we know enough about sugar and, the, and we know enough about addiction and we see the, the overlap. And just because the official uh, medical language uh, textbook doesn't say sugar's addicting, the signs and symptoms um, of addiction are there, and it's just a matter of time when sugar addiction becomes an official um, uh, way to describe what's what's going on. Because we have measurable changes in the brain that are almost identical to cocaine, as you mentioned, and heroin and um, other other addictive compounds, and we don't, you know, we we. We, and, and I sometimes um, uh, make, I, I don't joke, I don't make fun, but I, I make light of the fact that people who are addicted to sugar say the same things that heroin addicts say when you confront them with giving up heroin or, or helping them understand what's going on. Do you, do you recognize the, the problem you have? Do, you know, um, so um, part of the problem with, with sugar and, and the food, you know, all the legal drugs, is that we, we, we don't have any help. We've got a, we've got a, a, a massive uh, conglomerate uh, making a lot of money, the sugar industry, just as a general um, category, um, the junk food industry. And and um, of course they they contribute money to political campaigns and uh, and they keep a lot of people in work and uh, you know if you say something about cutting you know taxing sugar or cutting out the uh, the amount of sugar that's sold um, to kids you know you're considered a a communist or a radical, whatever it, the, the word is these days. Yeah. But you know, um, uh, so be it. We we don't we don't stop pushing the the fact that these these foods these um, harmful substances are killing the world. And you know, when when we have a world that's over with adults, that's over eighty percent over fat 80 percent that, that's eight out of every 10 people in the world so we're we're talking about india where you know you've got all these um uh supposedly these malnourished people but i did a study in india and showed that 80 percent of indian adults were over fat china which is actually just another way to be malnourished just because they're over fat it's a, it's a different form of, of of malnourishing and you know yeah. And so, how, you know, how do they get, how do they get over fat? How do they go from a, a nation that's predominantly malnourished and underfed and underweight to 80% of adults being, and a good number of children, being over fat? Well, you get that way because way back in the 50s and 60s, when um, uh, the Western world said, well, we got to help these people. And they sent them a lot of sugar and white flour. And generations of that support, maybe it was meant well, but there was a lot of money exchanged. You know, the, the junk food industry knew what they were doing. They were making a lot of money on this. But the US said, we, we gotta help, uh, we gotta help these people because they're starving to death. Okay, we helped people. A lot of them didn't starve to death because they got the aid, but now, uh, just two, three generations later, look at what's happened. They they have exploded in body fat, and um, all the the downstream diseases that are bankrupting countries like diabetes and heart disease are are happening in India. Yeah, we wrecked their metabolism, didn't we? We sure did, and and that's been happening all over the world. And of course, in the Western world, the the number of of um, 
um, overfat adults is much higher into the 90s, 91% in the US. Um, in, in countries like Brazil, it's even higher. Um, little countries like Iceland, it's, it's even higher. Um, Greece, you know, the Mediterranean diet. There is no Mediterranean diet. The, med the new Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet is junk food. And that's why 90 plus percent of the adults in Greece are overfat. And with overfat, uh, you, you have the question of, well, what, what's been causing that? Well, there's no question about what's been causing it. I've written about it in, in scientific journals. What causes it is sugar. Yeah. And, you know, we should define sugar because we're going to talk about sugar and um, uh, the problem, the bad rap that we have gotten in our careers. And mine goes back um, a little farther than yours. Um, but I remember as a, as a, um, a high school student and a college student, um, the debate about sugar and well, sugar is bad. No, well, what do you mean? Sugar is very important for the human body and for our brain. That's how we think that. So what's so, what's happening? The glucose thing. I get this argument from parents all the time because they think, oh, yeah. but, but the cell it's needs glucose. Glucose, so, glucose. So we, we yeah. Yeah. what's happened is, um, and the industry has participated in this um, behind closed doors. We, we, we have a terminology problem. So when two people are trying to communicate about the sugar problem, one says there is no problem, the other says it's a big problem. Well, they have two different definitions in their brain about sugar. So when we talk about sugar, let's define it. Sugar is, of course, added sugar. And there's so much added sugar in foods. And even though today it has to say it on the label, it wasn't that long ago when a package could say no added sugar and there was added sugar in it. So that's changed and that's better. Yes, okay, we're, we're progressing. However, there are still a lot of tricks the industry uses. Um, but what about a, um, um, a, a a piece of bread, uh, a bagel. Well, that's not sure, there's no sugar in bagels. Well, it turns to sugar right away because it's processed flour. And there is hardly any unprocessed flour in the universe. Yeah, even the stuff that says whole grain, whole wheat. Yes, whole oh. grain is one of the tricks that are used. You know, natural is a term that, you know, heroin is natural, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, I only do natural heroin. You know, I'm waiting for the organic heroin to show up. Well, and that's exactly what we see in places like Whole Foods. Um, this whole oh, industry yeah. has cropped up around organic. My daughter Haley would walk through the Whole Foods and she still only allows me, like if I start to head down the aisle, she grabs my arm, like you're not going down there. <laughs> you know, I'm, there's olive oil, Haley. I'm gonna get the olive oil. But the point is those aisles are lined with boxes and bags that have the word organic on them. And I love what she said to me, I'm stealing this line. Do you really think organic diabetes is any better for you? So we talk about that a little bit because people are being duped. And because here's the thing, parents want to do the best for their kids and they want to live a manageable, normal lifestyle among their peers. So they're doing their best, you know, and they're getting duped by these tricks that the industry has stored for them, right? Into buying organic. Yeah cookies you know what so let's talk about that w w without a doubt i mean yeah th these companies do surveys and have been doing surveys forever that's how they learn about us they know more about us than we do they know about our shopping habits they know how we think they know how they could trick us and they do a really good job of it and when, when the population starts thinking oh so uh sugar in the raw is just like regular sugar oh now the people who make sugar in the raw know that you're thinking that way because they've done surveys and they change it and it's it's called something different now. Um, but that's that's what goes on, and um, and so sugar sugar is is um, uh, basically uh, all of the uh, the the carbohydrate foods that are um, that are out there. Um, there there are there are very few uh natural carbohydrates lentils beans they're natural 
carbohydrates, fruits. Um, however, what we've done, thanks to the agricultural scientists, is that we've created a lot sweeter, uh, uh, a, a lot sweeter lentils and beans and fruits. Uh, because especially, especially in the U.S., the milk is sweeter in the U.S. than it is in Europe. The Coca-Cola is sweeter here than it is in other countries. So this is part of the process of, of getting more and more people addicted. Yeah. You change their taste buds, you change their sweet taste. Um, and like you tasted that, that chocolate bar, which didn't have a lot of sugar in it, but it had a little bit, you reacted as much, if not more, to the taste of that sweetness because you hadn't swallowed it yet, you hadn't metabolized it yet but your taste buds did. And now we have a whole generation or several generations of people who can only taste sweet. That's why they don't like vegetables. That's why they, right. they can't drink coffee because it's so terribly bitter because all of my taste buds that work are the sweet taste buds. Mm -hmm. So I have to put sugar in my coffee. Oh, but it's only a half a teaspoon or or one or two or three. So I, mean, I, knew, I knew people who put four teaspoons of sugar in a little espresso cup. Come on. Okay, well, and what think. you're saying there, that's a part of that addiction. That is a part of the addiction though, is because we've been, um, you yep. know, sure. accustomed to the sweet taste. And yeah, who wants spinach after, you know, they've had that other sweet stuff. And like you said, everything is sweet. Here's the funny thing, having not had sugar for years, you know what I found so sweet? I mean, I still do, carrots. Carrots are so sweet. Yeah. But carrots are bitter. Well, it's relative. Yeah, it's yeah relative. That, and, and you know, the most common um, uh, in our kitchens, the most common spice that we use is sugar. Yeah. We just throw it in tomato sauce. And I was at someone's house years ago, and, you know, they were making tomato sauce and, you know, into the bowl, <laughs> thrown in the bowl. Well, what are you doing that for? <laughs> oh, are you it's part of making tomato sauce and now you're like My tomatoes aren't sweet enough yeah <laughs> yeah now i have nothing to eat thanks yeah <laughs> That's... So, can you talk about this a little bit though like so when i ate that chocolate bar so when my my friend's daughter you know pops that snickers in her mouth you know like she's eating the halloween candy's being consumed now we're not they're not going to wait till they come home from trick-or-treating this year it's being consumed now so when i eat that chocolate bar and the first thing that happens is my brain lights up with the taste of it right? Which is the pleasurable part. But then what is that metabolic pathway? I mean, then what's happening next? And how did that lead to my anxiety? Yeah, you get, you get that initial rush, which is a neurological thing. So you stimulate the sweet taste in the, in the, in the mouth, on the tongue. And that sweet taste, that's a nerve ending. The other end of the nerve is in the brain. So that information goes up to the brain. The brain registers what's coming in sugar and certain parts of the brain are heavily influenced areas that control um, uh, uh, cravings areas that control uh, hunger desire to eat um, and then of course there are the dopamine centers which are um, you know part of this whole process that dopamine is is our addiction area that's our that's our um, um, that's our, our stimulation. That's our, you know, we, we, we have some cocaine and we feel great. It, it's like we're getting a reward. Yeah. Uh, the same thing happens with sugar. We're getting a reward and that's how sugar is seen, uh, as a reward. You know, here come the grandparents and here's your reward because you're our grandchild. Um, or from teachers, you got the answer right. Yeah, you got the answer right. Here's yeah. some here's mm -hmm. some sugar, um, and and so these reward centers, after a while, get used to getting rewarded. And and if we don't have a reward, if it's been a couple of hours uh, that we haven't had a reward, we want a reward. And we look around. Let's see, where's some sugar? I gotta have some sugar. I gotta. Ha I, I you know, and you go buy a bag of sugar and you eat it. Uh, whether it's in the form of cookies or uh, low calorie snacks or uh, crackers or uh, sugar free whatever, 
Um, and you know, um, a, a lot of people have sold out. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, it, it's like way, way back when cigarettes were advertised on TV, they got doctors to do the ads. Yeah. You know, smoke this type of cigarette because it'll soothe your throat. When I, uh, I, I worked in, in the, in the, the organic industry, uh, um, in, in doing research and development on, of, of products and, um, in the late nineties, when the, Organ when the government was going to take the word organic so that it was used properly, um, they set up, um, you know, these conferences where, where people like me can go and say, well, here's what I think should be done. Here's how you should be defining organic and here's what's not organic. And, and that all worked out really well until the very end of the process and the last minute, the big boys jumped in, the big chains of grocery stores and the big uh, manufacturers and the big, um, uh, you know, people who, who made junk food, basically. And they said, here's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, they got their way because they're, they run the market. We want organic sugar. We want organic white flour. We want organic potato chips. We want organic beer. We want organic soda. Uh, we want organic cigarettes. Okay, sure, whatever you want. And I remember going to the very first or trade association meeting, the, the organic trade association meeting. I don't know if that's what they're called now, but um, they're in it for the money. And uh, who was there lecturing? Um, gosh. Big sugar. Well, Big Sugar was there, but I'm trying to think of the, who was the guy years ago who started the whole organic gardening movement, and then he turned into a publishing empire. Mm. Oh, gosh, his name is the tip of my tongue. I'm so bad with names. Viewers can be Googling it right now. Look it up. Yes, they're Googling. So he, he started this organic movement. He, he had all these books about organic gardening, and, um, and then his son kind of took over. And then, and then suddenly at this organic trade association meeting was his daughter. So the granddaughter of the organic gardening movement was there and she was talking about how wonderful all this organic stuff was. And, uh, and there was a microphone in the middle of the conference room and I walked up to it and waited until somebody said, are there any questions? And I said, are you concerned about all the organic junk food that is starting to appear and will continue to appear? And she said, no, people, people can, can decide for themselves if they want to eat organic junk food or not. And what a sad situation. And you know, that to me was a sellout mm -hmm. of, of this big movement, you know, uh, we, 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 we wanted this organic movement to be something valuable to, to, to save the health of future generations. And it, it hasn't happened because things continue to get worse. And yeah. And people are confused by that. You know, I, I work yeah. with a lot of moms who will say to me, literally, Darcy, tell me what not, what do I buy? What do I not buy? Like, it is overwhelming the, the amount of information and misinformation. And I think, you know, I, I'm pretty comfortable being a little bit outside the mainstream, but a lot of people are like, they're still waiting and looking like they think the authorities, you know, that are our leaders and business leader, you know, that, that, yeah, these people you're talking about should do the right thing. They should be doing something to help all of us. And what we know yeah. they're really doing is helping their profits grow and we're on our own. We're just on our own. We have to figure out what yeah. to eat and what not to eat. Even the even the, the 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 groups, the organizations that are supposed to be guiding us, yeah. uh, right. the American Academy of Pediatricians of, of Pediatrics, for example, uh, finally, finally, after all these years, said that children under the age of two should not have any added sugar. Well, 
how long did this take you? I right. mean, this, you know, I understand the, the mechanism. You, you meet it, you know, two, three times a year. You have a board meeting. Oh, there's this idea about sugar. What should we say? Well, we're not sure. Okay, let's table it till next year. Yeah. Um, and what they also said was that above, at age two and above, children can have six teaspoons of sugar a day. How much is that? I'm trying to figure out how much. So how many grams of sugar would that be, would you say? Way more than they could tolerate. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, so on their second birthday, they could have several pieces of, of cake with icing, sugary cake with icing. Several That's pieces, so as long as they only have that in one sitting and not, you know, all day long, they could, that's okay. Um, so we're still in that situation where our pediatricians uh, and, and this information from the academies and from the organizations trickles down to the clinicians who are the ones that talk to parents. Um, this is what the media picks up on. Uh, the, the, you know, the American Heart Association says this, the, uh, this academy says that. And, and the media picks up on that, often gets it wrong, makes it worse. Um, like it's okay to eat sugar. That's well, have a you seen any of the, yeah, any of the recipes on the, like the ADA, American Diabetics? Uh, I, I can't eat any of the diabetic recipes. They have too much sugar for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really, it's yeah. really, um, it, it, it's just such a farce. And, and uh, th there's, there's, a, there's a bright side of all of this, which is that we as individuals can, choose how we want to live. We decide what we want to eat. And unfortunately, we have to get through this jungle of stuff, uh, terms, and the confusion that we hear, the confusion our children hear, because let's face it, as we both know, um, if we try to make some changes in a, in, in a child's diet, uh, whether we tell them or not, um, you know, when you're a sugar addict and you're five years old or 10 years old, and you get whatever you get for dinner and there's not as much sugar in it. So you know. let's, let's talk about that for a minute because I, you know, I don't, I try to help parents change um, diet and lifestyle so that they're getting nourished and not, you know, getting this, sugar's a toxin, right? Um, and, so how, how, what would you recommend that they do? I mean, do you think just, I did cold turkey, I'll tell you that. And I had headaches for three nights in a row and I was a pretty miserable person to be around. That was the first time I quit sugar, right? Because as an addict, um, it's pretty common that you're gonna have to do it again, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Like, what do we recommend? Because a lot of parents would be like, fine, here's your cookie. <laughs> just stop you know they have and they're working from home now and the kids are schooling from home now and the last thing they want is a sugar withdrawal right um can you explain physiologically what what that really is that's happening and why we might want to go ahead and take sugar out because people are caving in because they do not want to experience all this fallout yeah yeah i mean we, we we could talk about the physiological effects the neurological effects of you know you got that taste it goes up to your brain when you swallow that food and digest it and absorb that amount of sugar you get this big insulin release which then lowers your blood sugar now you're craving sugar you're hungry uh and it it starts this vicious cycle um but the the best way, the best answer for, for parents and, and kids who can conceptualize is that it's an addiction and you have to get off the addiction. I'm a big believer in cold turkey. Mm -hmm. if, if you've decided, if you've thought about this and researched it, you've talked to experts, whatever, and you've concluded that what I'm doing is really bad. What I'm doing is really bad for my kid, my children. Um, okay, now what do you do? Do you slowly change knowing that you're still hurting them along the way? Or do you say, this has to stop? If you're hitting yourself on the head with a hammer and you realize it's bad, do you only hit yourself on the hammer once every few minutes instead of once every 30 seconds or what, you know, what's the deal here? 
I want to go cold turkey. And how you do that with your kids is up to you. It depends on their personality, their age, how intelligent they are. You know, kids are most intelligent when they're born and it sort of <laughs> goes downhill from there. And the game is, you know, let's try to keep them from getting dumber and dumber as the years go by. Um, and I say that only half facetiously. Um, but kids we, conceptualize really well. They don't have any idea about, or nor do they want to know about the mechanisms of blood sugar and, you know, the neurological mechanisms, the metabolic aspects of hormones and how it affects blood sugar and what addiction is or is not. And the concept of this is bad, this is really bad, and this is really good. And we're not, we're not taking things away from the children are not putting something back. We're taking away this, we're putting back that. Plenty of things to eat, plenty of tasty things to eat. If you, as a parent, cannot make tasty things, that's a problem. Um, <laughs> well, we got but, the whole family eating the same way, right? So parents are gonna have to do this too, right? And exactly, I'm, that's I'm the key. We're not, we're not taking a child because uh, he or she is hyperactive or uh, uh, brain injured in some other way or, or has, uh, learning, you know, whatever they call whatever, uh, whatever is the latest name, it doesn't matter. You know, the great thing Glenn Doman did he, is he said, these names don't matter. It's all a brain injury. And let's treat the brain injury. And we can, we can talk about the specifics of a particular person's brain injury, but um, let's, let's, Let's not say is hyperactivity, you know, is that associated with sugar? I, I know, I know that learning disabilities are, but is hyperactive, you know, come on, it's all the same stuff. Yeah. Uh, and there's nobody in science, there's nobody in the clinical world, unless they're connected with the food industry, who will say it's okay to have six teaspoons of sugar a day. Right. Or, or, or even less than that. So, um, the bottom line, it's 2020. This is not 1984. It's not uh, 1960 when um, uh, people would eat sugar because they were tired. That was a big thing. Um, and and um, so let's just stop what we're doing and work on this problem because it is a primary problem with ourselves as, as adults, and it's a primary problem for children. These are the children who are going to go, grow up to be uh, over fat, potentially, uh, diseased, physically impaired, and mentally, emotionally impaired, because that's what sugar does to us. It's, it's really as simple as that. Yeah. Now, how you, how you change your, your, your shopping list, uh, what you make for dinner now instead, that might be a learning process, uh, uh, although people, a lot of people do know how to cook. They may or may not, but they know how, they know what to do. Um, you have recipe suggestions. I've got recipes on my website. It's, it's really common sense. And the problem with sugar is that it's taken us away from common sense. So yeah. when, when, when I say to a, to a patient, um, uh, you, you know, Stay away from all uh, bagels and rolls and cookies and cakes and um, rice cakes and cereal. And, and at some point they stop me and say, what do I eat? Let's talk about that. So, what do they, that, so many people say this to me too. And I'm going to take a moment just to pitch. I feel like when you said it's as simple as that, we could have just cut. Like, that's it. That's all we really need to know. <laughs> But then you do have to do something about it. And I'll pitch here for a minute. I, I do this. I provide this as a service. So if you want to go to my website and look it up, there's a, there's a free discovery call. We can talk a little bit more about it. But I absolutely take people under my wing and help them walk through the steps of this. It, not this, this instead. And, um, but so I always say if you could, this is a little out there, but I say if you can kill it and eat it, I eat it. If you can pick it and eat it, I eat it. Most everything else is kind of in that, you know, in the no-go zone. A few, a few exceptions, right? Like our olive oil is in a bottle. At Haley lets me go down the aisle for that. But let's talk about this because the definition of food, I think, in our culture is just too broad. So really, what should we be eating? Well, Only we, 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 we want to we wanna go to the truly natural food items. 
uh, which are, of course, the, the fresh vegetables, um, meats and fish, uh, not the packaged slices of, uh, uh, of deli meats, uh, because they often contain sugar. They usually contain sugar. Um, uh, dairy, if we tolerate that. Um, I, have a, I have a good article on my website on uh, dairy, a dairy update or something like that, where it talks about, um, you know, healthy, uh, healthy milk, healthy cows and unhealthy cows. So the big corporate cows that produce tons of milk, very unhealthy. And that's why people are allergic to milk and dairy products. And then there's the smaller brown cows, the, the jerseys and so forth. They produce less milk, but more fatty milk that has a different type of protein that people are not allergic to. Um, so, um, and they're not abused. And they're not abused. Um, um, so, so those are the foods we, we want to eat. The question becomes then, um, how carbohydrate intolerant are you, is your child? How insulin resistance, which is the old scientific term, um, and the more carbohydrate intolerant we are, the less natural carbohydrates we can eat. And in between the two are things that are very high glycemic and things we should stay away from, like fruit juice. Orange juice, the great American breakfast, the great world, you know, like but it's you're a going cup up, of sugar, right? It's a cup it's of a sugar. It's a cup of sugar, yeah. Um, and and so um we need to understand that, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the foods have been made, they've been grown or made to be, to have a higher sugar content. They've been, basically they've been bred to have a higher glycemic index, which means eating this apple today causes us to make a lot more insulin than it did uh, 20 years ago. So that's, that's, you know, that's that, that gray area that we need to, it's not really a gray area, it's really part of the refined carbohydrate, but, but how, how much, uh, you know, lentil, uh, beans, um, uh, fresh fruits can we consume? It depends on how uh, carbohydrate intolerant we are. And the older we get, the more carbohydrate intolerant we are, the more we've been junking out our life, the more carbohydrate intolerant we are. That's why, we are now seeing children, young children, becoming type 2 diabetics. You know, they used to call it adult onset diabetes. They don't call it that anymore because now children get it. Children are getting cirrhosis of the liver, non-alcoholic cirrhosis due to sugar. Um, is anybody listening? I know there are people listening. You've listened. A, a lot of people listen um, and have acted and have made some amazing changes, but um, we're in a situation now which we were, we were getting to the point where people were, were the sugar industry was, was seeing that their profits were diminishing because people were buying more natural food. So they were trying to get into this natural environment with, with selling natural products, buying natural companies. And, um, and they were doing a good job in countering that. Uh, and, and suddenly COVID comes along and that was the best thing for the junk food industry because really? everyone ran to the junk food mm. to buy it off the shelves. What were the only oh, places yeah. they can go to buy food uh, other than a, a grocery store? A restaurant. The only restaurants open were the junk food restaurants because yeah. they were the only ones that had drive up capability. I so, saw that during COVID. I thought, oh Lord, here it comes. Everybody's in the drive up line to get food. Oh yeah. No. And yeah. and and people are, you know, they're stuck at home working, which I think is a great thing. But yeah. if your home isn't a wonderful place to be, it's not a great thing. And if your kitchen is a vending machine, that's a problem. And so what's happened, we know for a fact that people are gaining weight since the lockdown, since COVID um, has done what it's done to the society. Uh, people are gaining weight. People are um, buying more junk food. Uh, they're abandoning uh, things because they think erroneously that 
healthy food is more expensive than junk food. It's not. Mm -hmm. When you start comparing it logically, illogically, oh, this box of cookies is only, you know, 89 cents, but this, this steak is, uh, you know. $10. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, junk food is cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> But that's, but that's not, not how it works, run. of course. Yeah, but not in the long run. And Haley, well, Haley always is amazed. She points out these things. She's just got this vision. She'll notice, like, when you open the, the flyers for the grocery shopping, you know, the popcorn is buy buy one get seven free and it's yeah. right next it's for 99 cents right but it's and it's right next to your diabetes medicine um <laughs> is right there too like so in the long run um these cheap foods that are nutritionally devoid of anything the body needs to to grow heal repair itself um yeah you're right and you know the the it's not just the sugar the, the junk food, the, the refined carbohydrates that turn to sugar right after you eat it. Um, it's not just that those are bad, they are bad, they're really bad, and it's, it's created a big mess that we're in. But by putting those in your diet, you no longer eat all these healthy foods. So where do you your nutrients come from? They don't come from anywhere. Maybe some of that junk food has fortified, uh, has been fortified with synthetic vitamins, and the government says, yeah, they, these are okay. Well, they're not okay. Uh, we've, cre we've created genetic mutations as a result of some of those things, like synthetic folic acid. Yeah. Um, and, and, that, and that's a very serious problem. That's and do you recommend most people to be checked for that now? I mean, I, because we're two generations down into that gene mutation, and I know, there's a, I know that's why, you know, we're seeing, I've said this before, too, anxiety. I know that part of the anxiety I see in these I hear a lot of moms talking about their little tiny kids, one, two, three year olds that are being diagnosed with anxiety disorders now. And I also know what those families are eating and not eating and it's everything I can, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, it, there, and there's, there's a very strong connection because of uh, what folate uh, yeah. does metabolically and, and cancer, very strong connection with, with that. And they're now seeing, um, <coughs> excuse me, con uh, connections with, uh, combining two things, like people who consume too much alcohol and have that folate problem. That folate problem basically is that you have a deficiency in folic acid. You can't get, you can't folate. use your, B, yeah. And and um, and the combination of those two now creates all kinds of other problems. So it's uh, there. There's a lot of new research coming out about that, but um, uh, but the fact that we have all this junk food means we don't get the natural folates, the natural nutrients that are part of a diet. And uh, of course, eating a, a synthetic vitamin pill uh, doesn't help you, actually hurts you. Um, and there, there's all kinds of stuff about, um, you know, uh, well, we need folic acid because women of childbearing age, um, you know, it reduces... Uh, uh, these these problems by 70 percent. Well, what about the other 30 percent? Well, that's how many people have these genetic mutations, and so they're being ignored. Um, and the, I've I've written a bunch of articles about that, so people can find that on my website, and you probably have it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think, about some I think the one, you know, if I was going to give just, you know, one recommendation and we could just, you know, be on online here for one minute. Oh, hey, you, you know, what's your one recommendation? Stop eating sugar and all the things that turn to sugar. All you have to do is one thing. You don't have to worry about counting grams and calories and, you know, looking at how do you balance it? You know, just stop eating. And then when you do that, you've eliminated a big chunk of what you're eating. And of course, you're going to be hungry. So you got to put in more stuff that you can eat, which is the natural food. And um, uh, you could do it on your own. But, there, you know, you and I both have information people can use to speed that process. So, it, you know, that's the recommendation that should be done. And how you do that for your family, and it is a family thing. It's not my child has this problem and, you know, he or she is going to have special needs. We all have special needs because we're individuals. Right. 
Yeah, we have special needs because we're human. So we need to eat the foods, you know, that we've evolved to eat. That's the other thing I wanted to say. We're going to wrap it up here in a second. But so many people think that it's normal to just, you know, push a cart along and throw things into it. And um, that is normal in these modern times. But, you know, we've evolved. Um, we've only been doing that for just a blip. A blip. Our and for all the time, the millions of years before that, we already knew how to eat. Even though we didn't have junk food. We had a lot of variety, of, I mean, a fair amount of variety. And we knew what to eat, what not to eat, how much to eat, how little to eat, when to eat. We, we knew that because we had something called instincts and intuition. We had a brain. And what humans did, in, in the earliest humans did, that separated them was, was that massive brain development. Suddenly, relatively speaking, suddenly humans developed big brains and big bodies. And they did that by eating a lot of fat and a modest amount of protein and hardly any carbohydrate. That's the human diet. And that's the way I eat now. And I am just, I'm thriving. I just, I feel better than ever in my life. And um, so that's something that I'm just really passionate about sharing with other people and learning how to do that. I'm delighted that you brought us there because the whole what not to eat um, and then if we can land there, what to eat, definitely more fat. Can we talk just for a minute about quality of fat? Everybody's been taught to think fat is bad. You've written extensively about it. I talk about it a lot, but give us the one, give us the one truth about fat. Natural fats are not only healthy, but essential to health and fitness. It's that simple. Yeah. Olive oil, uh, uh, animal fats, lard, the the infamous boy that's really bad uh coconut oil uh of course the 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 companies that make the bad fats the the vegetable oils want you to think that coconut oil is the worst thing that ever existed um but of course that's not true what's the worst thing that ever existed was sugar but also those vegetable oils soy corn peanut oil canola oil safflower those are really really terrible very unhealthy very highly processed uh and they should be avoided and anything hydrogenated no and anything that. hydrogenated no, no. which people are finally knowing that uh, and you finally see it on the label um uh, so natural fats are are essential they're called essential fatty acids because we have to have them from our diet because we can't make them ourselves it's like all the other nutrients that we have to get in from our diet yeah. And the brain is over 60% fat. So it can only make itself from what you put in there. It is. Yeah. It is. And, and, you know, all the, all those, those good healthy fats that are in dairy and egg yolks, uh, you know, beef and whatever, you know, you don't have to eat beef. You don't have to eat pork, but even if you're vegetarian, you eat eggs and, and dairy, you're getting a lot of healthy fats and you could be you could be very, very healthy uh, with that approach. And I just want to say that you, 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 you mentioned this before we, we started recording. You are a certified MAF health coach. Um, we have we have founding certified coaches. You you being one of them, and I'm so happy that um, people like you have um, uh, learned about uh, the program and and you know are, are now helping other people that's that's you know I, I never thought that that was where I was going that people would start uh, passing this information on to other people and wow it's really you know um, an honor for me to see that happening so thank you for all the work that you're doing and all the stuff you will be doing like finishing your book and other things well, thank you. That means so much coming from you. So thank you very much. I, again, I just I'm uh, delighted that you took this time with me today and to help explain some of these things to